Hi, everyone. Hope everyone had a great day, and hope you're excited to wrap it up with us, if you're wrapping it up, I guess. We're probably halfway through, let's be real. I'm Shara Senderoff, and I'm here with my co-founders of Readyverse Studios, and I have the honor of being an entrepreneur that works 24 hours a day and uh, runs teams that you'll see what we're bringing to life this week, and I also had the honor on top of all that of moderating this session. So just thought I'd add that to my list and make the week extra fun. So we're gonna have a lot of fun today talking about metaverse technology, all things that are really uh, interesting topics and I'm sure everyone has a lot of thoughts in all different directions on the matter, but we're at a really prolific moment in time where the themes of Ready Player One are actually going from science fiction to reality. So this year of 2024 and being here at South by Southwest is pretty special for a lot of reasons that we'll touch on today. And so without further ado, I'm gonna let my esteemed co-founders introduce themselves. Mr. Ernie Klein, take it away. Hey guys, I'm Ernie. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming today. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, I'm a novelist and I started out as a screenwriter and then became a novelist. I wrote Ready Player One, Armada, Ready Player Two, and I have a new book called Bridge to Bath City that's coming out in a few weeks, and uh, I'm excited to talk with you guys today. Uh, my name is Dan Farah. Um, prior to Readyverse, primarily been focused on working as a producer to build commercial film and TV projects and to represent talent, mostly creators. Um, I'm one of the producers of Ready Player One, the movie, and been collaborating with Ernie for about 18 years now. Yeah, good day everyone. Aaron here, all the way from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, first time in Austin. Great city, loving to be here. First time at South by Southwest and kind of surreal to be up here with some of my heroes uh, to talk to you about Readyverse. I'm, a, I'm the tech guy. I've been 25 years in technology um, and co-founded Futureverse with Shara, which is a leading AI and Web3 technology company. We're partners in crime and all things, so it's Super fun. So we recently announced that we've come together to form Readyverse Studios, which is a next-gen technology and experience studio. And it was predicated by the fact that we believe that the timing for mass IP to evolve the way consumers engage with the stories that they love is now. There's no IP that has shaped the global culture and the conversation around the potential of the metaverse more than Ready Player One. I think we can all agree, in this room especially, and since we've read all the articles that open up with in Ready Player One, just like in Ready Player One. And so congrats, Ernie, for shaping that. Um, but to that point, we're gonna start with why we came together. So one of the most interesting parts of the film, I think, is that it opened by saying in 2045, but it's 2024. So did that mean that we just beat the prediction by 20 years? What is your feeling on the timing of all of this and why now? Uh, well, I, the timing just blows my mind that all uh, uh, came about much more quickly than I anticipated. I, uh, uh, 2045, I thought, was a maybe conservative estimate that something would happen uh, uh, on that level by then, but it, uh, it happened, it, all, it began to happen um, almost immediately as, I was, uh, as the book was published, and then uh, a lot of the people working on the technology uh, uh, ended up drawing inspiration from it. So. The time was incredible, and I can't, I can't believe we're here in Austin talking about what we're talking about now. Yeah. Uh, it's incredible. Some people might say it's scary that it's accelerated this fast. You can imagine that we believe it's amazing and it's going to be a really fun ride, or it is a really fun ride because we're in the metaverse now already. We'll get to that. So, Dan, why don't you jump in and give us your perspective on how this all came together? Or why is this moment in time important? How did it, obviously, one of the most important and very cool things that Aaron and I have respected about both of you is that you're not only creators and filmmakers, but you had the ambition to bring to life something you put in a movie, which most creators just put it on screen and make it as crazy and fantastical as they can, and they don't give much thought to, could this become a reality? Take us through your ambition to do that. All right, yeah. So Ernie and I actually started talking about Ready Player One when we met here at South By in 2006, he was already working on the book, and obviously we were excited to one day hopefully turn it into a big movie, but even back then we talked about wanting to one day 
bring the ideas that were in his head about the future of the metaverse and interoperable experiences, bring them to life. The technology wasn't there at the time though, so years later, um, after the movie came out and gave people an idea about the potential of the metaverse, technology was finally starting to catch up, so we started talking with potential technology partners to help us bring about our ideal version of the metaverse, and that's when we met Sharon Aaron, and they had this incredible company called Futureverse with really remarkable tech, and they were the ideal partners for many reasons, including they shared the same vision and, and um, just belief system on how to do it, how to do it right, and so we all came together. Like Dan mentioned, Aaron and I came together to launch Futureverse, an AI metaverse infrastructure company about three years ago. Prior to that, I've spent my career for the last 15 years as a hybrid technology entertainment entrepreneur, which you can imagine is very fun because you get to be in the middle of two sides of a coin that don't necessarily want to work together, where technology historically has set a precedent where they take creative and IP and they don't necessarily do right by the creators. And on the other side, creators and Hollywood and brands feel like technology just comes in and, and owns and, and emphasizes and changes business models in their favor. And so I've been in a position where I've been constantly trying to blend and recreate and redefine how creators and technology work together so that it can be a more symbiotic relationship and we can find a better way to, to have mutual benefits. And so when Aaron and I first started talking about the fact that Ready Player One is referenced in everything that speaks to the metaverse, it, it is the quintessential IP that showed the masses what the metaverse, the potential of what the metaverse could be, we knew that if we were going to do something with our technology, we had to also, the same way the technology was gonna change and evolve the internet, we also had to evolve the relationship with, with the creator. So it was simply a non-starter for us to bring an IP that didn't have creators involved in a really, really deep way. And when we met Ernie and Dan, it was, a match made in heaven because you rarely come across people who actually understand what technology can do. So that made a really big difference in how and why we came together and that's why I think this founding team is really special. So now that I've said metaverse probably already 15 times, you guys have all said it a bunch and we'll go on to say it a thousand times, I thought it would be a good idea to start with defining our perspective on what we believe the metaverse is. Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions around what it is, there's a, a lack of clarity around what it can be, and so people lack an understanding of why it's, Im it's important that we build the underlying technology and why it's important that IP come into it now. So Aaron, why don't you give us your perspective on the definition of the metaverse, because it's my favorite. Yeah, so um, maybe start at like the highest possible level and then drill down a little bit. Um, I think the first thing to understand is the metaverse is already here. Um, you know, the world that we live in today is this world that is influenced and contains this digital society. Um, people talk sometimes about the, you know, the digital economy, for example, um, or digital society. And the reality is if we took the digital out of our world today, it would probably collapse. You know, we're so dependent on this technology. In fact, the average human will spend about 45 years of their life looking at a screen. So to say that the metaverse is this thing that's going to happen is kind of silly. We're there already. Um, and what people jump to is things like gaming and VR and AR and all those kinds of things, which are part of this evolving merge of society with technology. But, um, but fundamentally, the metaverse is about a few things. I think the first thing is this idea of convergence, immersive convergence. Um, and that's a journey that's already started. I borrowed that term actually from Tencent. Um, and um, a really good way to think about that would be to think about something like the silos that existed early on in the internet. We had communications, we had commerce, we had media, we had finance, we had gaming, they're all kind of quite separate things. Um, you went to different places, you know, telecommunications companies and uh, media companies had their own separate network infrastructure, it was all very distinct. And then things started to come along that would smash those user experiences together. Social media was probably the big first thing that took 
communications and media and put them together in one platform and changed the industry for both of those things. Um, and that has continued to happen and we're seeing um, things like commerce now, the fastest growing commerce platforms in the world, merge social with commerce. Social commerce is another immersive experience on the internet that took those separate things and push them together into one more streamlined customer experience. And so that's kind of the fundamental idea of the metaverse, is that these different customer experiences are coming together in one customer experience journey and in one place. And the ideas of things like gaming, for example, are making their way into the way customer experience is designed more than um, gaming is the metaverse, if that kind of makes sense. So with that in context, the most important thing about the metaverse is actually the data layer. And so the future of the internet, if we think the metaverse is the internet growing up, um, we want to have a data layer that is open, that is user-owned, and that is interoperable. So as many applications as possible can connect to that data layer and provide customer experiences. And we don't end up in a place where all of that staff stuff happens in one corporation's application. And that's really what the mission of the open metaverse is, is to create the technology for interoperability that allows anyone, whether you're a kid in your backyard or you know, a brand that's trying to connect with your customers, to access that open user-owned data layer and create experiences on top of it that are interoperable. And just to add on to that on the data layer, to make it really simple, the I know sometimes when we say that term, it's like, what are we talking about? The data layer is information about you and information about the things that you love and the things that you use and where it's stored. So it's really simple. We all have information about ourselves, our identity, and that's something that, as Aaron touched on, we believe is, is the catalyst and the underlying layer, layer that makes the metaverse the metaverse and is critical in how we'll go on to evolve the future of the internet. So, Ernie. You're clearly a psychic, which we now all know. <laughs> but one thing I will just add is that I've been working in Hollywood since I, for the last 15 years, and I've been able to work with some of the most amazing storytellers and creators and writers. And one of the things that I think about every day and I noticed the first time I met Ernie is he has a heart of gold. And so there's no coincidence that he wrote a movie and a book and then the, the screenplay and stories that talk about characters that operate from a heart-centered place. And that's really, really, really important because we all know that as technology evolves in all of the areas that we've talked about today, maintaining the why you're doing what you're doing is critical. And why we're, and that why is more important now than ever with how the metaverse evolves. And so Ernie, as one of the greatest visionaries and storytellers that I certainly have had the honor of working with, can you talk about some of the key values of that you wrote in in a narrative, frankly, that was a battle for the technolo technological control of the world? What were the values you were thinking that had to be maintained underneath it all? Well, I was trying to, when I was uh, writing Ready Player One, I was trying to imagine the coolest possible future version of the internet and of video games kind of conflated together uh, and a picture of what that would be like in 30, uh, 30 years. And uh, imagining that, you know, and it was kind of modeled on my experience with the early days of the internet, uh, uh, which felt like this new frontier uh, uh, that was an egalitarian technology that everyone could use and have access to and um, uh, regardless of your uh, personal resources and it created all these possibilities kind of opened uh, it was like an escape hatch into a better reality uh, is how I describe it and so picturing um, uh, the Oasis which is the metaverse in, in Ready Player One uh, uh, I pictured this kind of sprawling virtual world that was interoperable that was kind of the one platform to rule them all uh, where every video game you had ever played and every movie you had ever watched all existed in this virtual space and had its own uh, uh, it was kind of interoperable, all this IP, and you could take, uh, you know, a magic sword from uh, uh, Middle Earth and uh, to a completely other uh, planet, Hyboria, devoted to Conan, or uh, to a cyberpunk world, and you could have Star Wars and Star Trek planets anchored, you know, in different sectors, and it was uh, uh, such a fun idea, and so much, it was the video game that I always wanted. Uh, you know, and the version of the internet where it's not just isolated websites. Instead of websites, you have planets uh, that you can travel to, and each, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, surreal estate, you know, your own kind of uh, virtual place that you could, if you meet somebody from the other side of the world in, uh, in the metaverse, you could have them over to your house to hang out. So all those things, but just the idea of a free and open space that is not controlled by any one uh, entity. And that's what the characters in the story are fighting for, is for an open metaverse that is egalitarian and accessible to everyone and not controlled uh, by any one um, uh, uh, person or entity. And that's what's so exciting to to me about working uh, with you guys is that we're after that same goal of not creating a closed metaverse, but one that uh, uh, where everyone who has a world to build would will, will be able to connect it and have it be the groundwork that uh, underlies a, an open metaverse that everyone can have a part of and have uh, uh, control of. And you can take your you can take your stuff from one world to an next. So that was all stuff that was you know imagining uh, in the story that uh, has miraculously. <laughs> started to become possible. AI and the metaverse as two different topics are really interesting. We obviously saw the rise of NFTs a couple years ago, and then we instantly pushed that away for the hype of AI. And suddenly it's AI, AI, the metaverse is dead. We don't really believe that's the case. We believe there's two sides of the same coin. Aaron, jump into your vision of how they're coming together and why they always were intended to come together. Yeah, I think what you said there is, is right. They are two sides of the, the same coin. I gave a um, keynote at the Morgan Stanley China Summit and the first slide I put up was, um, you know, long live, uh, so the metaverse is dead, long live AI. Kind of tongue in cheek. Um, and I get a little bit of kind of history before I can explain the context. Throughout the evolution of the internet, every time we've made it easy for people to create a certain kind of content, it's become the default kind of content on the internet. And so in the early days, it was really hard to make websites. You know, I was an, I was an engineer building dial-up networks back in the day, in, in the early days of broadband. Um, and you had to know how to code or know someone who could code, and those people were rare and expensive. Um, and as the internet progressed, it became easier. You know, tools got made like uh, Wix and Squarespace and WordPress so that anyone could go and create a website. And so now everyone has a website. Um, and the same thing happened when social media came about. You know, anyone could then become a publisher and now the default kind of media consumed is from those, you know, from those platforms. Um, and so every time we make it simple for people to create a certain kind of content, that becomes the default content on the internet. Now what happened when we had the hype of the metaverse was the same thing that happened when the first days of the internet came about. Everyone rushed to build something that resembled an immersive experience and quickly figured out the only people who could do that were game developers. There weren't very many of them. They became very expensive to, to find. And so you ended up with a kind of um, demand that couldn't be met by supply and certainly couldn't be made available to everyday people. Um, and what we've seen with AI now is the creative power of a game developer coming to life with tools that you can talk to. And that's, that's an exceptional um, change in the way that content can be created. Um, we've been building tools to do that for music. We have our own foundation models for music, for 3D, these kinds of things that can enable anyone to conjure the worlds that they imagine. And so when we put those tools in the hands of users, that will become the default kind of content that's on the internet. You can't imagine a world where AIGC exists and dominates and in the same breath say that that content has nowhere to live. AIGC content lives in the metaverse, and that's why the two things are important and why they come together to create this possibility. And the rise of the conversation of AI has really helped the metaverse. I think, as we mentioned before, the definition just becomes challenging to understand, and everyone's trying to understand where this is going, but nonetheless, we can affirm that everyone wants to jump in. They do know it. it's really exciting. So Dan, let me throw it back to you as a filmmaker and creator of IP and certainly someone who's worked on the marketing side as well as you bring a lot of your big properties out to the world. Talk to us about the timing of what you're seeing in Hollywood and with big IP in relation to their willingness to jump in and test the waters of, of what the metaverse can become. Yeah, so I would say most of the big IP in the world is owned and controlled by the major US studios and 
right now more than ever, those businesses have to focus on their core business of making movies and TV shows and putting all their resources towards, towards that. And so for the most part, studios are just sitting on these rights. And um, we think it's a great opportunity for them right now because it's a fresh revenue source to exploit their IP. It's a way for them to reach their fandoms, a bigger way for them to reach their fandoms. A lot of big movie franchises and TV series have long lag periods in between installments. So it's a way to keep your fans engaged, give them things to do, allow them opportunities to you know, engage with the stuff they love in the downtime in between. Uh, there's really no downside right now. And um, in reality, studios don't have the bandwidth or the resources to go figure this out on their own. So we're, we're pretty much a turnkey solution for them to do cool stuff, create new revenue streams, create new opportunities for their fans. Yeah, we felt like the timing was now with to create a studio that would sit in the middle of what technology and Hollywood and IP were trying to do because everyone was raising their hand saying, we're ready to jump in now. Just how do we jump in? Where do we start? What does this look like? How do we engage consumers? What are the value propositions of the metaverse and what do they allow that other platforms we're putting our time, money, and attention to don't necessarily allow today or won't necessarily allow in the future. So on that point, Aaron. The other, the other thing about it too is I think studios are all looking for opportunities like this. When we announced Readyverse in January, started getting a lot of incoming phone calls from studios that own big IPs and we want to, we want to put our IP in your guys' hands. Um, I think one of the reasons they also find us very appealing is that we've been on both sides of the fence. So we understand their sensitivities, how they want to protect their content, the kind of things to look out for to make them feel safe and make creators feel safe. And exactly, and to that point, they've also said, okay, what is the value proposition here? What is the core value of the metaverse? What are some of the core values of the metaverse? And so I want to talk today to keep it really simple and high level so that everyone can walk away with something that's really tangible. Aaron, let's jump into the core values of the metaverse around user ownership, meaning you can own and control things that you love. And obviously we've talked about interoperability a little bit, which is you can take the things that you own and control with you. Now that requires a lot of tech that we're gonna get into, but let's talk about the fact that ownership means very little if you can't take it with you. If I can buy something and I can only leave it in my house, well, unless it's a couch, why does it matter that it's there? If I can't bring something with me, if I buy a suitcase and I can't travel with it, how does that work? It doesn't. And so, Aaron, let's talk about our approach to identity and ownership, and then we'll go into interoperability at the Readyverse. Yeah, um, so yeah, like Shara said, I think particularly for those who've been in the Web3 um, track, you know, with the um, advent of the, the NFT craze, um, people really started to understand the concept of digital ownership um, and something that Ernie kind of portrayed actually very well in the, in the books and, um, and was brought to life in the movie. Um, but, um, but as Shara mentioned, ownership without interoperability is meaningless. You can't own something that lives in someone else's yard and truly claim that that's your ownership. And so um, you have to bring those two things together. But if we start with, with ownership, um, you know, one of the most important things for society, I think, right now is to get to a point where they are truly in control of their data. And if we think of those emerging themes around how AI will impact society, you know, positively and negatively, and where that will go from a um, uh, economic structure, social structure, all of those kinds of things. Um, the thing, the fuel that feeds those machines is your data, your data. Um, but at the moment, you don't own those things. And so one of the foundation things we need to get right in an open metaverse is data ownership. And so we started that journey by creating a kind of passport, we call it a ReadyPass, where you can own your own digital identity, you can own the data about you, you can take your social networks with you, um, you can take your communications and conversations with you, and you can take the things that you value in the digital space with you. So creating that foundational layer is the first step for um, creating the open metaverse, giving people control back of their identity and their data, and making that open in a way that can be interoperable with lots of applications, so you don't go and recreate the same silos again. So trying to provide that same 
um, really good user experience you get from tech platforms with single sign-on, but make it, um, deliver it in a way that gives people and communities control over it. So that's the first part. On interoperability, this is really hard, and particularly when you start to get into immersive content and gaming and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, those of you who are developers or producing content out there, you know that if you're making a video game or something like that and you want to produce an avatar, um, you're making it for the type of game that you're making. Is it multiplayer, single player? Um, the platform you're on, is it mobile? Is it, is it a console? Is it web? Is it desktop? The engine, is it, is it Unreal Engine? Is it Unity? All of those kinds of things impact the, the type of content you create and how you create it. Um, and that stops interoperability, because to make it work across all those different things in the past has meant you've had to create lots of different versions of those assets. Or you would go towards a standard that was cross-platform, but you would get the, the most average experience across all of those things. So the same thing that worked in a mobile phone would look crappy in an Unreal Engine 5 experience. Um, and so what we've been doing is working really hard on a brand new standard for interoperable content that lives in the metadata layer and not in a file, and that any application can interp interpret on any engine, on any platform. And so you can truly have ownership of your data and your content and portability with platforms. Very well said. So Aaron mentioned earlier, and this is one of my favorite things we talk about, that we believe the metaverse is the internet growing up. And to just go a little deeper on that, it means that the internet is gonna get more mature and have better values and better benefits for individuals like we just talked about with some of these things. And just like humans who tend to hate change and really dislike evolving, why would the internet be any different? What's interesting around the topic of Web3, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows this, is that it has its stigma and it's had varying Levels, levels and layers of commentary around what it is. But what's really interesting is we're talking about Web3 as if we talked about Web2. We weren't 10 years ago like, we're in Web2. All of a sudden, Web3 came along and we're talking about Web3 as if it's like this whole new thing. Really, it's just the next step of where we go, where we look and say, have we been doing it right? Is there a better way to do it? And then we solve some of the problems that haven't been solved and then we evolve how we evolve. And so some of the commentary and the negativity a bit about Web3 really is that people haven't wanted to change. And, but what Web3 will enable and what the metaverse will enable is putting humans at the center of the internet. And to that point, Aaron, let's talk about a lot of the incumbent launchers and marketplaces and platforms right now and how they in particular want to avoid the shakeup of Web3 because they don't necessarily want consumers to have the ability to control their assets and control their data because it may take away some of the revenue. It may change a lot of the ways that they've been doing business. And so now I wanna get into what we're actually doing and let's make this really tangible. So. Let's start with the Readyverse platform. Aaron, give us the overview of the Readyverse platform. Yeah, so I think the best way to describe it is um, the Readyverse platform is a set of tools that can enable um, users and developers to create connected and interoperable content. So instead of um, having to come to our place to do things or to find things, um, you can connect to those tools at that data layer, that identity layer, the content layer, and make your applications in a way that can be interoperable with each other. Now, that's a good first step, you know, that kind of open approach to um, creating content that has the benefits that certain platforms and marketplaces bring with the user experience, but done in a way that is more open and available to everyday people. Um, we're gonna put a layer on top of that, an experience layer on top of that, that people can come into that's immersive, and they can interact with their own personal curator um, that will, an AI assistant that will help them discover content and applications and experiences that's interoperable with the things they have and with things they love. And so you can imagine an experience where you might have a pair of digital shoes, for example, um, and you go in and you're talking to your agent, having a conversation, and that agent can notice that your digital shoes are compatible with 
a game over here, and it can suggest you can go and explore that game, and our platform will take care of launching that experience for the user. Now, that could be made in Unreal, it could be made in Unity, it could be on web, it could be in social experience, um, but they can find and discover these things using the Readyverse platform and connected with this interoperable technology underneath. So the Readyverse, by the way, Aaron and I merged 11 companies together to create Futureverse three years ago. That poll, those 11 companies were infrastructure, AI, and content companies that have been building in the blockchain Web3 space for six plus seven years. So we have not just come up with an idea that we're starting now on. We have been building this for the last seven or so years, and now we came together with these guys two years ago. We're here talking about it now, and we're excited that we can tangibly talk about it. And the reason we're talking about it now is because it's coming this year. This isn't something that we're going to see you in five years around. This is something that we're now publicly talking about because it's coming. So the Readyverse has a very simple user experience. If we think about or we want to understand how a consumer comes into this, like Aaron mentioned, the Ready Pass, which is your passport to the open metaverse. So think about it simply like this. You come in, you get your passport. Now, how do you want to show up in the open metaverse as an avatar? You want to be Parzival from Ready Player One? You want to be Mickey Mouse? Do you want to be Barbie? Do you want to be a nondescript version of a character or alien or creature that you made yourself. You can bring a digital collectible in that you already have, or you can get one from there. And then once you come in, you need a place to live. So you need your home. So that's the real estate that Ernie mentioned from his brilliant mind that he created and that we saw in the books in the movie. You get your surreal estate. Your surreal estate can be decorated in any way you want, or it can be branded. And that's where we've partnered with brands that will launch branded surreal estate. So that's where you'll be able to live in a home that is one of your favorite scenes from one of your favorite properties. And then from there, you shoot from the Readyverse, like Aaron mentioned, into through a portal and into any of the experiences that you want. So Ernie, that sounds fun, what I just said. Shoot through a, yeah. shoot through a portal into anywhere you want. And you are the king of wish fulfillment. You showed us on screen and in your books in the most elaborate detail what wish fulfillment can look like. And you're a gamer yourself, which is what makes you incredibly unique to, to be a part of this team. Talk to me about some of your, one of your favorite wish fulfillment moments that you conjured up in your mind. That would, the biggest wish I had fulfilled was my getting my dream car. Uh, it was a result of publishing Ready Player One and then realizing, oh, I could buy a DeLorean finally. I've wanted to have one <laughs> since I was a, a, a kid. And, uh, and now I can drive it on my book tour and use it in my author photo and it'll be a business expense. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's what I've done. I actually own two DeLoreans now. I have a Star Wars DeLorean I am transforming into the Mandalorian. Um, uh, it's got an R2 unit on the back. I wish I had pictures, but um, the, uh, so yeah. Um, uh, uh, and then I got to uh, drive around the country uh, uh, in that car on my book tour and have people like honking at me and freaking out. It's like driving a celebrity when you drive a, a, a DeLorean. And I've slowly converted it into the uh, Ecto-88, the ghost-busting DeLorean that uh, uh, Parzival drives in my novel. And then it you know, appeared in a Steven Spielberg movie uh, based on my novel. So that, the DeLorean has followed me you know, uh, 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 from the first time seeing it as a kid before even Back to the Future came out, and then Back to the Future, one of my favorite movies of all time, and wanting to own a time machine. And uh, uh, so I've gotten to live this whole uh, uh, fantasy uh, through that uh, owning my dream car that's also tied into the dream of my novel and, and all of that coming true. So Ernie just schooled us on wish fulfillment and then manifestation. <laughs> so just if anyone's taking notes on how you manifest. You just think of the things you want, and then you put them down on paper, and they become a reality. So well, that will be another session, maybe in the psychedelics uh, track. <laughs> so um, speaking of wish fulfillment and flying DeLoreans, which we can all on this uh, panel say that we love, we're going to do something very special today and premiere for the first time ever the trailer of our hero experience coming to the Readyverse. This has never been seen before, and it will publicly go out online at, after this panel. So you in this room will be seeing it for the first time. This is the trailer for Open, our AAA metaverse gaming experience.
we've been working incredibly hard for, for years, and we're very excited to show that and now talk a little bit about it. So Open is clearly built in Unreal Engine 5, and we believe there hasn't been a defining Web3 powered AAA MMO experience with top tier IP like Ready Player One and other IP that we'll, we'll get into talking about now. And so before we jump into the details of, of the IP that's included and what this will look like, Aaron, let's talk about the format of the game. Yeah, so Open, Open is kind of our flag, flagship product for the, um, for the Readyverse, be one of the kind of highest quality experiences out there, like Charlotte, uh, Shara said in Web3. Um, and um, will feature like beloved IP from across your favorite um, uh, film, TV, brands, um, and, and the open world of Web3. And so bringing those together into a new kind of game experience, um, which builds off the ideas, I think, that, that were portrayed in the novel, um, which is this kind of battle royale format um, but with a twist, multi-biomes. So each biome can kind of represent a different kind of IP, but also a different kind of game mode. So battle royales typically apply to shooters, and we'll have that experience in there. Um, but battle royale format, format would be applied, applied to car racing. So it would be car racing biome. Um, each one of these is a progressive com uh, competition um, where the um, winner takes all just like in a battle royale, and so you can be the overall winner within a particular um, type of game format, within a particular type of biome, or across the whole game. So really kind of trying to take battle royale and twist it up a bit, pro provide some innovation in there, and provide a home for different kinds of game st styles. We think that'll be really appealing to um, a segment of um, game players that might be left behind. Um, you know, if you look at both bringing nostalgic IP back together and fine-tuning game mechanics for people who might be a little older than you know the, the early teens, um, where your click rate isn't the most important thing to being successful, where you can have a chance of being competing at different kinds of game mode to win the overall game. We think it's a really exciting prop uh, proposition attacking a totally um, forgotten John, uh, kind of, um, not genre, but segment inside of gaming. Are you saying that because your son destroys you? At it Fortnite? is. It's mostly because my son destroys me and I want a chance to get my own back. <laughs> so Aaron, jump in a little bit about the team behind this game because yeah. this isn't just a small little group. So if you're going to put those words out there, AAA, um, you, you need to have the kind of people to back that up. And so we've been out there um, and working behind the scenes to pull together an all-star team. So we're collabed with a studio called Walker Labs, um, based up in Europe, um, and they have pulled together an all-star team from, you name it, Epic, Ubisoft, EA, um, Mojang, um, DICE, Microsoft, PlayStation, to, to build a high quality, and we think the first AAA experience in Web3 with AAA IP. Dan, speaking, speaking about yeah, go ahead, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, we've found that all the major studios are super excited to have their IP come into open uh, to create avatars based on characters and big movies, and TV shows, weapons based on things from those movies and TV shows, just other experiences to do in open based on their IP. Um, so it's, a, it's an exciting time. Okay, we have one more trick up our sleeve. So those are two pieces, the platform and open. Ernie. The Easter egg hunt is clearly the main plot of Ready Player One. For those of you who have seen it, you know that. For those of you who haven't, since we have the master in the room, and it feels like we have to do something like very fan related, can you, in your own words, tell us about the Easter egg hunt? Explain how it worked, what it was, how you designed it. Yes, in the, in the novel, the creator of the, the Oasis, uh, the metaverse-like uh, uh, world in my book, uh, he dies, and it's uh, an, an announcement is released to all the users uh, that he's hidden a series of Easter eggs uh, uh, throughout the, this sprawling virtual world, uh, and uh, characters have to collect a series of uh, open th three hidden keys and find a series of three hidden uh, uh, keys to uh, three three open three gates and find three hidden keys 
uh, to win actually control of the oasis and uh, uh, trillions of dollars. Um, uh, so th and that was kind of based on finding Easter eggs in old Atari games when I was a kid, uh, like Adventure and, and Yars Revenge, and always uh, finding Easter eggs or something hidden by the creator uh, in a virtual world uh, that I was playing uh, always resonated with me when I was young. And so it was kind of marrying that idea with uh, what if Willy Wonka was a game designer and held his golden ticket contest inside the greatest video game ever created. Uh, uh, so that's the, that's the heart of it, and, uh, uh, and it's kind of, that's the inspiration behind uh, uh, what we're doing in our uh, hunt inside of uh, Open. So off of the hunt, which is obviously one of our favorite parts in general, and we couldn't leave that behind. Aaron, let's talk about the third pillar of the Readyverse ecosystem, which is the hunt. We're currently developing hunts with a lineup of major brands, which we won't, Aaron, announce today. <laughs> Aaron, don't announce anything for everyone who might in this room know Aaron McDonald. He likes to drop things and leak things without telling me or anyone, <laughs> including the people who are a part of them. So Aaron, do not announce them. But if you go back and look at the trailer, you'll find some Easter eggs for some of them. And those brands that we're developing hunts with, or a lot of brands that we're developing hunts with, um, let's explain, Aaron, how that works. Yeah, so there's two parts to the hunt. Um, so if you think, like Shara said, your kind of first entry point is this passport that you can take your stuff with you. Um, the second thing is this place to discover experiences, connected experiences in the open metaverse. The third thing is open, which is our flag flagpole you know, hero experience. Um, and then the last thing is the hunt. Um, the hunt has got two halves. So if you think about us bringing together lots of game developers who are building lots of different kinds of experiences and making them accessible through the Readyverse, um, what we wanted to do was create a thread that could bind all of those things together. So it felt like you were playing one big metagame. And so the hunt on one side enables game developers to embed quests inside of their games and activities and experiences that tree up to a global leaderboard. So you can have lots of different games connected to the hunt um, and everyone playing each one of those games is earning uh, their way up this ladder, up this leaderboard and earning rewards on the way. Um, intersect that with the opportunity for brands and IP to offer experiences and value to those consumers. And so you could have hunts happen on your website, in your social page, in your e-commerce um, experience, in a physical location, um, at a movie theater, wherever you want to engage your consumers, you can trigger these hunt experiences that help those users who are playing the overall hunt game to climb the leaderboard and give them new kinds of digital rewards. We're launching an experience very soon with Reebok that will showcase how simple hunts are and how helpful they are for consumers, and, and also sort of on top of what Aaron said, you won't really know that you're in a hunt until suddenly you realize, oh, I'm a part of a meta internet game, and I've just entered the playing field, and now I can engage with the brands I love, earn rewards that I could have never earned before, keep them in a place where they're easy to find, really, to ac really easy to access, really easy to turn in, multiply, and be a part of a larger experience and suddenly we'll be in the meta of what the hunt can really be. So that kind of takes us through what we're working on, which we believe is really special and exciting. And it's really interesting, like we opened up and talked about the metaverse isn't coming, it's here. And there are so many people we know, not only on the stage, but in this room that are working on areas and important parts of how this all comes to life. And like we showcased in Open, and the reason we call the game Open is because it is the platform that we stand on, which is to be open, to be collaborative, to be inclusive. There is no one that we won't work with, and, and we'll hear a lot, and we've all heard a lot about some of the major metaverses that have existed up until this point, or games and experiences, and everyone's like, why do I need to go there? Why do I need to go to you? Why do I need to go here? We believe it will all be one place one day, and we believe that that has already started. And so it's not, we're waiting for that next chapter to come. That next chapter has already began and 
we hope to be a huge part of what it can be for, for the better of everyone online and, and everyone's values and our values being brought out into the world in some really big ways. So that does it. Thank you guys for being here and for uh, working with me. It's my honor to, to be a part of a team like this. And thank you all for coming to hear about what we're doing. Yeah, and if you want to find out more, head to readyverse.com. So if you're a creator, you want to connect your thing that you're building to the Readyverse, check us out there. If you're a brand, you want to engage with your consumers in a different way. If you're a studio and you've got IP you want to bring to life, go there and check out those things and we'll be waiting to help you do that. Thank you, thank you all so Thank much you for guys. coming. Thank you.